I adored listening to Diane Millions and the conversations that I have had with others who work in this carceral field. But can I be completely honest with you, just between us? <laughs> I've struggled to understand my role here and my place amongst you all. So many of you have done so much work in this field, the plethora of publications and the depth of your research is really quite staggering. There are people I have met who have been inside prisons teaching, facilitating, learning, educating, and supporting for 30 years or more. For my part, I can only say that I've volunteered on and off at the Edmonton Institute for Women since 2010 and recently co-facilitated a six-week course at the Remand Center uh, on Indigenous Art for 12 of my brothers. We also have future, future plans, as you heard, for a 10-week spring course at the Edmonton Institute for Women next month. So what can I tell you? What can I impart in 20 minutes? 18 now. <laughs> what I can tell you is this. As a Cree woman, a Nehe Squale with two daughters, I'm compelled to work in this field. I am obligated and I am accountable. This is my blood. This is my ancestry. These are my brothers and sisters. Today I talk about the policing of Indigenous bodies and share some of the work that we're doing at the Indigenous Women and Youth Resilience Project at the University of Alberta. Sound good? Oh, good. I'm glad someone agreed. <laughs> Indigenous women, girls, and genderful people have suffered greatly. Over the past 60 years, there have been over 1,400 Indigenous women, girls, and genderful people who've gone missing or been murdered in Canada. And although Indigenous women are only 4.3% of the population, Amnesty International reports that they represent 16% of all murders against women. Even more horrifying, these statistics don't even include disappearances or forms of violence like rape. And according to the Native Women's Association of Canada, who's done great work, Aboriginal women are almost three times more likely to be killed by a stranger than other women. This is my daughter. Indigenous women between the ages of 25 and 44, my daughter's 27, my other daughter's 25, are five times more likely than other Canadian women to die a violent death. Kwakwaka Wak scholar and activist Sarah Hunt states, quote, stereotypes about the sexual availability and willingness of Aboriginal girls and women has resulted in generations of sexual violence and abuse continuing outside the law, as though it were not illegal to rape or batter an Aboriginal woman." End quote. These stereotypes were embedded into settler consciousness through the condemnatory language of early missionary and historical settler accounts, which suggests that the criminalization of Indigenous sexualities and genders began at first contact. Any freedoms or diversities of indigenous sexuality and gender were silenced with the colonial language steeped in sin, shame, and perversity. This damnation of indigenous bodies due to this so-called deviancy added to the colonial invocation of terra nullius, meaning empty lands, to justify the theft, possession, and exploitation of indigenous territories. Even within our own communities, Indigenous women, girls, and genderful folk are policed. We have restrictions placed on our bodies, or we are prohibited from attending various ceremonies under the guise of following cultural traditions or protocols. Indigenous traditions that prohibit female-coded people from participating in ceremony or needing to wear certain um, forms of dress derives from the invasion of the colonial narrative and demands the homogenization of a heterosexual patriarchal normative. Emma LaRock warns us, quote, as women, we must be circumspect in our recalled tradition. We must ask ourselves whether and to what extent tradition is liberating to us at all as women. There are indications of male violence and sexism in some Aboriginal societies prior to European contact. As Native women, we are challenged to change, create, and embrace traditions consistent, consistent with contemporary and international human rights standards." End quote. So the work I'm doing currently 
is um, the director of the Indigenous Women and Youth Resilience Project at the University of Alberta. And we realize that Indigenous women and youth are prolific scholars, poets, podcasters, actors, lawyers, filmmakers, doctors, artists, and more. And yet, and yet they experience some of the highest rates of suicide and violence the Indigenous Women's Resilience Project combines Indigenous scholarly and community methodologies to explore the idea of resilience of women and youth and mobilize those findings into the long-term research initiatives like a proposal for a Canada Research Chair and the establishment of an open access digital research centre dedicated to Indigenous women and youth resilience and resistance. This project began from a relationship between the Faculty of Native Studies and the Provost Office at the U of A, dedicated to increasing Indigenous lead initiatives and responding to the truth and reconciliation calls to action and the current inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The Provost Office offered funding to the Faculty of Native Studies to host a symposium on resilience and employ a project coordinator and director for two years. This project is also an act of resistance scholarship and is guided by the principles of Wakotuin. This research must be done carefully and with careful attention to relationship, kinship, and relational accountability. Cree Soto author and academic Mara Kovac relates that an indigenous methodology must meet, quote, the criteria of collective responsibility and accountability, end quote and that as Indigenous researchers, quote, we can only get so far before we see a face, an elder cleaning fish, a sister living on the edge of East Vancouver, our brother hunting elk for the feast, our little ones in foster care, and hear a voice whispering, are you helping us, end quote. The first objective of the project was to utilize the talent experience knowledge of Indigenous people within our university community at the administrative student and faculty levels. So I approached four prominent Indigenous women, one fiery undergraduate student and a two-spirit man with proper protocol and asked them for their commitment to meet four times a year to advise us on this project, talk about community needs. Our first meeting was in August and we had a resilience committee. The Indigenous community located within the university is a launching point for a larger investigation for Indigenous resilience. So my project coordinator, Sarah Howell, has begun databasing Indigenous organizations and advocates dedicated to Indigenous women and youth empowerment and health. The objective of these databases is not only to create a collection of primary source material for a resilience research center, but to also map prominent Indigenous practitioners of art and intellectual expression across Canada. The project approaches the painful and sensitive topics of violence and suicide by engaging with practices of resilience of Indigenous peoples, the artists, the writers, the filmmakers, the survivors, scholars, dancers, the project addresses violence against women and youth through an investigation of the practice of survival and resilience and is rooted in community experiences. We continue to gather Indigenous knowledges and perspectives using conventional as well as Indigenous research methods. We've met with our Resilience Advisory Committee, the Native Studies Student Association and the Aboriginal Student Council and together decided that facilitating research gatherings of Indigenous peoples and students to discuss resilience is an effective approach to our project mandate and would encourage that intellectual and kinship relation of Wakotuin that acts as, as a bedrock in many Indigenous communities. So one Indigenous methodological, methodological? methodology way, one way, <laughs> so fancy, one way requires gathering with a good mind and a heart. And to do this, researchers, participants, and advisory committee, we always begin in prayer, and we clean ourselves by the smoke of sweet grass and sage. And this creates the space necessary for the people to come together and trust the space enough to discuss the often painful realities of their lives especially the stark contrast of resiliency next to murdered and murdered women and youth lost to suicide. Never underestimate the power of the smudge. 
The respective bodies of literature on indigenous women and resiliency theories are highly developed and circulated. Since the 80s, scholarships about and by indigenous women have covered topics ranging from the fur trade, marriage, labor, health, violence, and political economy by Van Kirk, Brown, Montreux, Angus, Perdue, Carter, McCallum, Shoemaker, Anderson, Lawrence, Green. More recently, scholars, policy analysts, and community workers have been publishing increasing amounts of material of the relationship between violence against Indigenous women and youth and the practices of resilience. Don Laval, Harvard, and Jennifer Brandt forever loved exposing the hidden crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And Kim Anderson, Maria Campbell, and Christy Belcourt's edited collection, Kitsatanak, Our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Sisters, due April 2018, are the most recent contributions to the topic of violence against women and youth from a perspective of resilience. In these cases, resilience work includes grassroots organizations and aesthetics of multimedia, walking with our sisters exhibition, as well as discussions on lateral violence within communities, resiliency, and indigenous sex workers. This complex discussion of colonial and lateral violences with resilience is a brilliant intervention from the Indigenous scholarly community. As historians Jarvis Brownlee and Mary Ellen Kelm have noted, social scientists have struggled to convey the complexity of Indigenous experiences and tended to identify Indigenous people as either passive victims of colonialism or active agents and adapters to change. Scholars such as Leanne Simpson, Kim Anderson, Don Laval Harvard, Joyce Green, and Maria Campbell continue to theorize and narrate the layers of oppression and agency that weave through the lives of Indigenous women. The Indigenous Women's Resource Project contributes to this trend with our commitment to community-based research. research. The Creek concept of Wakotum is one such indigenous philosophy that can be applied to approaching violence with a lens of resilience. Wakotuin is a theological and intellectual concept which argues that the spiritual and physical world are connected through an elaborate, elaborate physiological and socio-cultural relationships. This term also refers to a social organizing principle in which communities determine living arrangements around kinship networks. When sharing her story with Anita Olson Harper for an article about the Sisters in Spirit organization, an anonymous mother spoke to her experience of healing after her daughter's DNA was found on Robert Picton's farm. This mother articulated that the grieving process for her family included collecting her own strength and working to care for her grandchildren, ensuring that her pain did not hinder her responsibilities as a kookum. This is an example of a resilient response to violence that can be articulated using the concept of Wakotwin. The violent death of one woman sparks a reaction from community and reverberates within a series of interconnected responsibilities. <clears throat> Resiliency theorists might contend that this mother's response to her daughter's death was one of many possibilities Beginning in the 70s, resiliency theory, as practiced by the social sciences, burgeoned into a field dedicated to understanding the conditions under which some people flourish or struggle in response to social or economic adversity. Researchers of resiliency theory study the interplay between adversity and individual and community responses, questions who succeeds and who struggles. Resilience theorists develop complex models that seek to explain all the possible responses in negative environments. In 1998, M. A. Zimmerman published an article stating that low self-esteem tended to create a negative connection between cultural identity and alcohol consumption for Native American youth. Pamatsuin, a journal of Aboriginal and Indigenous community health and Timati, is a journal that publishes works relating to Indigenous health and well-being from the perspective of social work and health professionals. And these journals publish recent findings on indigenous resilience research globally, combining psychology and health sciences with resilience theory. While Zimmerman and others have addressed indigenous peoples and resilience from a health science perspective, 
Indigenous social scientists in Canada argue that definitions of adversity should be approached from an Indigenous socio-political context. Métis scholar Jesse Thistle's recent contribution to the definition of Indigenous homelessness is an example of indigenizing a definition of adversity. While some may identify being without a house as a meaning of homelessness, Thistle argues that being without all my relations or Wakotwin plays a larger role in the realities of Indigenous homelessness than being without a physical shelter. More Indigenous concepts and philosophical approaches are needed to build effective frameworks for understanding what adversity, resiliency, resistance, and change means to Indigenous peoples. Leanne Simpson argues that Indigenous critical philosophies, quote, have much to teach the Western world about the establishment of relationships within and between peoples and the natural world that are profoundly non-imperialist, end quote. The Indigenous Women's Resilience Project builds on these scholarly contributions by implementing customary com um, concepts such as Wakotuin, as well as recent developments from scholars such as Thistle, Turner, Simpson, and others, not only to build a theory, indigenous theory of resilience, but to nurture relationships with other educators, activists, and community members at the University of Alberta and Amiskwichi Waskahaginik to create a landscape of Wakotuin in the pursuit and conservation of rigorous scholarship. This project conducts its investigation in the spirit of Emma Rock's sentiment to create, quote, resistance scholarship that interrupts contemporary thought to the benefit of our larger communities. The result of this labor functions as a long-term initiative with open access research conceived and created by Indigenous communities for the benefit of Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples alike. The gatherings and research approaches and the indigenous methodology of kinship and consensus building with the establishment of a committee of indigenous women, youth, and two-spirit men, our project remains accountable and in constant relation to the communities we serve. The project is due to officially finish in July 2019, but the project will never really be finished, will it? I will conclude with this. We are more. We have more power than we are told. We have more power than we believe. We are the songs, the stories, and the blood of our grandmothers. And these things tell us truths. We are not the vulnerable and the weak. We disavow the categories of whores, victims, bad mothers, addicts, prostitutes, welfare recipients, or brown body temptresses. In our actions, our words, our statements, we define ourselves and shall fight against the racialized, simplified, stigmatized, and sexualized versions of ourselves. So why do this research, and for how long? Until there are no more missing, pushed off a building, burned, put in a hockey bag and dumped on a dirt road, left to die naked and alone in the cold, tortured, beaten, cut, murdered indigenous women, girls, and genderful folk. For the most part, the common occurrence of the sexual and gendered violence against Indigenous women, girls, and genderful people, those unnoticed by society at large. And this blind eye attitude is a brutal reminder of the continuous process of colonial subjugation at work. We remain mired in a shameful and tragic drama in which every Canadian, even us as well-intentioned researchers and educators, plays a part. Eximaka.
to, to think about and reflect on. And we talked a bit earlier about hope, and you also had that message, so I want to thank you. Um, and I'm very honored to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to take part in this very important um, forum. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming on a Sunday uh, morning at the end of a long conference and uh, giving us your time and attention. And I'm also honored to be here on the traditional territories of the Coast uh, Salish people. Um, my talk today is going to be looking at Islamophobia and the security industrial complex. Um, I'm not sure that I'll be leaving with a lot of hope in the same way, um, uh, or a similar kind of message, but um, I, I, I do have some uh, reflections that I'd like to share uh, with you today. I'm gonna speak from here because even though I have a dance background, there's a complex choreography between slides and notes, microphones, water bottles, and it's too much for a Sunday morning. So I'm gonna do it sitting. Um, so, oh, see, now I have to click. Okay. Oh, thank you. Is it that one? Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna start with a quote from Naomi Klein. And uh, she says, in just a few years, the homeland security industry, which barely existed before 9-11, has exploded to a size which is now significantly larger than either Hollywood or the music business. Yet what is most striking is how little the security boom has, is analyzed and discussed as an economy, as an unprecedented coverage of unchecked police powers, unchecked capitalism, a merger of the shopping mall and the secret prison. When information about who is or is not a security threat is a product to be sold as readily as information about who buys Harry Potter books on Amazon or who has taken a Caribbean few cruise and might enjoy one in Alaska, it changes the value of a culture. Not only does it create an incentive to spy, torture, and generate false information, but it creates a powerful impetus to perpetuate the sense of peril that created the industry in the first place. And for me, I think that's a good lead into uh, looking at this notion of Islamophobia and the security industrial complex, where in this new world order, the military and security communities, along with academics and the media, function within a security industrial complex to create new ontological categories through which Muslim youth, especially males, can be profiled, studied, policed, disciplined, and detained. And that's not to say that those are the only bodies that are part of the security industrial complex, but it has been the focus of, of my research. Um, okay, so. Okay. Um, according to Sorry. The idea of the security industrial complex, which I'm just starting to, to think about. Uh, so in a way, you know, academia is like comedy. You try trying out routines, and so this is a bit of a rehearsal for, for what I've been thinking about. Um, but the idea of the security industrial complex describes uh, how the boundaries between internal and external security policing and military operations uh, have been eroded, and this is according to uh, a report that was put out by Hayes in 2006. And um, the process has been accelerated by the development of new technologies for the surveillance of public and private places, of communications, of groups, and of individuals, a trend that has been accelerated by the so-called war on terror. So these technologies include a myriad of local and global surveillance systems, the introduction of biometric identifiers, electronic tagging, satellite monitoring, paramilitary equipment for public order and crisis management, and the militarization of border controls. Uh, military organizations also dominate research uh, and development in these areas under the banners of security research and dual-use technology, avoiding both the constraints and controversies of the arms trade. Um, in addition to that, I don't have time to expand on it now, there are the role of what I call embedded academics who work with security communities in furthering these agendas rather than um, trying to challenge or disrupt or, or dismantle them, but are very much embedded with the agendas of the security communities. But that, that is a separate paper, but I did want to uh, flag that as well. So, um, Foucault describes something called the carceral archipelago and uh, of prison-like institutions, but also includes things like charitable uh, societies, moral improvement associations, organizations that hand out assistance, and also practice surveillance, um, workers' estates and lodging houses, 
which functioned as disciplinary mechanisms with all too visible marks of the penitentiary system. This view of society as a carceral archipelago, according to Foucault, means that we now live in a world where we are constantly being watched, judged, disciplined, evaluated, and controlled by different experts who write reports about us. And Foucault writes that, these are the, that the judges of normality are now everywhere. He also goes on to explain that the carceral network in its compact or disseminated forms with its systems of its insertion, distribution, surveillance, observation, has been the greatest support in modern society of the normalizing power. So I would argue that the biopolitics of governmentality that constitute disciplinary societies include a set of precarceral measures and conditions. And I refer to these as what I'm trying to look at as a security archipelago. And again, this is sort of the work in progress, and this is sort of a working definition that I put together that it's a set of institutions, technologies, economies, and policies involving both the state and non-state actors that both construct and respond to ideologies of risk and result in specific securitized conditions, identities, habitus, and dispositions, as well as leading to psychological and affective forms of conditioning and response. And these are formed through a nexus of biopolitics and necropolitics within the context of post-9-11 governmentality, so the power over life, death, and banishment. And so thinking through some of this in the context of my own work, I just flagged a couple of examples of more of the systemic um, aspects of this, this security archipelago. So looking at border eugenics is one. This is a, something that I look to in terms of how do we examine ideas such as, or practices rather, such as the Muslim ban in the United States and the way that we sort out the savage and civilized from various borders is a form of eugenics um, and ties into this notion. Um, and the notion of racial securitization as well. Uh, the racial securitization, because when we talk about security, we cannot uh, uh, not talk about how it's coded in various kinds of racial forms. Uh, and then finally, which I'll touch on a bit in this uh, talk, is CVE, or countering violent extremism in that particular industry. Um, and uh, so I will touch a bit on that as we move along. But those are some examples of what might constitute the security archipelago, although I see it is much, much broader than simply those institutions. Uh, but it's a starting point. All right, so uh, in this making of a panoptic society, um, the ACLU documented the surveillance industrial complex or how the American government is conscripting businesses and individuals into the construction of a surveillance society. Um, what was called the TIPS program, Citizens Corps recruited average citizens as well as private sector workers into these watch programs um, and then asked them to identify and report on quote, suspicious behaviors. So even neighborhood watch families were trained on identifying suspicious behavior that could lead to terrorist activity. So we already see the slippery slope that is emerging from this. Related programs from this involve the inclusion of truck drivers, real estate agents, and, and boaters. Um, so we're seeing this, uh, the far reach that this industry um, has. Okay. Um, Yes, and then I'm getting confused between my slides and my notes, but sorry. So Eagle Eyes is a program that's built as an anti-terrorism initiative that enlists the eyes and ears of the Air Force members and citizens in the war on terror. Uh, this is in the United States. And in addition to telephone tip line, the program offers training in how to detect terrorist activity. Uh, so we see the, the recruitment of the public right into the broader domain of a securitized industry here. Uh, and it says in their, in, in their literature, anyone can recognize elements of pot potential terror planning when they see it. Um, things to watch for include, quote, people who do not seem to belong in the workplace, neighborhoods, business establishment, or anywhere else. If a person just doesn't seem like he or she belongs, there's probably a reason for that. So they're really, you know, interpolating, uh, you know, groups of people into this idea of the bodies out of place, those who don't belong, and we, we know how that is coded as well. Um, and the report also notes that public appeals that are based not on crimes that have been already committed, but on the prospect or suspicion that an individual might be planning something bad. 
and and this very much ties into um, you know the kind of uh, creation of suspicion that um, these policies enact. Many suspicious behaviors cited by the authorities have uh, no rational or proven connection to terrorism, and in fact. Um, you know, are, are doubtful that there are such things that can be defined as predictors of behavior in the first place. But these tip centers that have, were set up uh, were already attracting sort of malicious tips from individuals, turning in neighbors that they dislike, tips about strangers engaging in, quote, un-American activity, and of course many reports based on racial profiling. Um, they've also reported that, uh, the Virginia police reported that they got calls from people who, who seen someone who looks like a Middle Eastern Middle Eastern person in the store, library, or maybe on the computer. So these were telltale signs, I suppose, of radicalization or um, terrorism in that in that project. So that was a little bit of how we start to see, and it's far more you know deep and embedded uh, than just that example. But that's one I thought I'd 